OK. Mitaniku Ankki. Hello, my name is Grant Manyheads. My Blackfoot name means singer. And I'm one of the interpreters here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park. And today we're going to be talking about the history of fire water, liquor, um, and its effects on the Blackfoot speaking peoples. So that includes all four bands that make up the Siksika the Beaks. And basically, that's the Siksika, the Gaina, otherwise known as blood, and the Bikani. And there's two Bikani tribes, one in Canada, and there's one in the States, and we call them Amskapi Bikani. But Bikani basically means like shabby robes, and this was the name that was uh, given to them countless, countless thousands of years ago. So this is where the Blackfoot tribes are. There's actually four of them that exist today that make up the Siksika the Peaks. So actually, let's move on to the first image. Now today we're going to be talking about when the Blackfoot people started to trade with the Americans. And this was about 1831. Because before then, anybody that came from the American side was considered an enemy by the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Now by this time, the Blackfoot speaking peoples had already made peace with uh, uh, Hudson Bay Company men and the Northwest Company men. So the French and the English that were coming through the North Saskatchewan, the Blackfoot looked at them as friends. But these uh, quote-unquote white people that were coming to the Blackfoot people from the south, well, because of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and because the Lewis and Clark expedition actually killed two Blackfoot people, the Blackfoot looked, as the Amer looked at the Americans as enemies. And so for the longest time, any of these people that came up into Blackfoot territory on the Missouri or on the Yellowstone, the Blackfoot simply killed them because they were considered bad, they were considered enemy. So it wasn't until 1831 that the Americans finally established trade relations with the Siksika Itzita Beaks. And this is when they built Fort Union. And in this image, you can see Fort Union in the background there uh, at the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers. So where the two rivers met, this is where they built their, uh, their fort, the American Fur Trade Company. So this was built in 1831. And when they started to treat with the natives, they didn't hesitate to use whiskey. Like the Hudson Bay before them and like the Northwest Company people before them, they used it to entice the Blackfoot into trade. It wasn't necessarily so sold as a commodity. It was basically when they came in to trade, they would give them some liquor so they would kind of get them uh, drunk or get them feeling good. And then they would give them uh, a few kegs to take back to their camp and have a good drunk. And then when they were done, they would come over and sell their robes. And the Americans were taking mostly buffalo robes because they had the means to transport the buffalo robes down the river. Whereas the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company usually took smaller furs like beaver pelts or mink or otter or muskrat or pelts like that. So it wasn't until 1831 that the Blackwood started to trade with the Americans. And this was, you, this was mostly because of a man named Culbertson. And this Alexander Culbertson had a wife who was Blackfoot. And in Blackfoot, we kind of, the name that they come up with is not the Wista, or sort of like, a, I'm not too sure of its meaning, but this woman was Blackfoot. She was from the Blood tribe. And her father was two sons, who was actually a blood chief. And she's the one that married Alexander Culbertson. And it was mostly because of her approaching her own people and telling them that you can trust these people uh, to trade with, that the Blackfoot started to come to the Fort Union Post to actually trade. Now, where this Fort Union Post was, it wasn't, it was right at the edge of Blackfoot territory. So to the south, you had the Crow coming there to trade as well. And then to the east, you had the Cree and the Assiniboine coming to trade there as well. And both these tribes, all, all three of these tribes were enemy tribes, and the Blackfoot treated them as enemy tribes. So there was a lot of bloodshed and a lot of warfare between these tribes during this time, 1831. So if we look at the next image, after uh, Fort Union was built, they wanted to go further into Blackfoot country. So they went quite a few miles up the Missouri River and they built Fort McKenzie. Now Fort McKenzie was, uh, was a trading post that was closer to the Blackfoot territory. And this is where the Blackfoot came to trade. But also the Cinnaboyne, they were um, up in that area as well where this fort was. So you can see in the picture here, uh, the Cinnaboyne and the Cree attacking a small Blackfoot camp that was camped around the out outside of Fort McKenzie. And this was actually witnessed by uh, some Europeans. There was a man by the name of Carl Bodmer. He was a Swiss artist. And this is his rendition of what he witnessed. And he was there with a man called uh, 
Prince Maximilian Duweed, or Duweid. But this, these two people were visitors to Fort Mackenzie during this time, and they got to witness this Blackfoot Assiniboine battle. Well, these Cree and Assiniboine attacked the Blackfoot there because they knew that the Blackfoot were coming in to trade their robes for whiskey and for trade goods. And as I, it's written here, during the decades of excessive distribution by the fur traders, liquor created havoc among the tribes as people killed each other in quarrels, and they had serious feuds and disputes. And so these tragedies during these drinking bouts were not uncommon. So in this particular situation, a small group of Blackfoot went there to trade their robes and they were spied on. They, the Assiniboine had seen them coming in. They knew exactly what was going to happen. They knew that the white traders there were going to get this group of Blackfoot drunk. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of these Blackfoot started drinking the whiskey that was given to them by the American fur, American fur traders. And during the middle of the night when they were nice and blitzed, drunk, then the Assiniboine attacked their camps and they killed quite a lot of the Blackfoot. The only thing that saved these Blackfoot, other than them fighting back, was the fact that downriver there were other Blackfoot camps that were camped on the Missouri River. So these Blackfoot camps came to the aid of, these, uh, of their brethren and they managed to push the Assiniboine and the Cree back and drive them off. But this is what happened at Fort Mackenzie. And at Fort Mackenzie, there was quite a lot of liquor that was given out. So there was a lot of tribes that kept on coming over to this particular post. But eventually, the Blackfoot burnt this, this uh, Fort Mackenzie down because of uh, a lot of the violence, particularly on the traders. There was a man named Harvey who opened up cannon fire on the Blackfoots in 1842, I believe, uh, around that time. And after that, the Blackfoot simply didn't trust these white traders here. So if we look at the next image, here we have Fort McKenzie and that event I was telling you about. This is kind of a rendition of that. This is when the, they enticed the Blackfoot in and the Blackfoot were coming in to trade and they were open fired on the first Blackfoot people that came in. Uh, and this was kind of a, not a good thing because uh, there was a Blackfoot group war party that went through here about a week before then and killed some of the fort's inhabitants. And when these Blackfoot people came to trade, the fort's inhabitants looked at them as um, enemies. So they opened fire and killed about 14 people. This happened in the 1840s. So just like around the British forts, the use of liquor resulted in tragedies around the American forts. And so periodic drinking in the Siksiketita Peaks, their home camps, it also resulted in violence and bloodshed. And this is, uh, it was only when the Blackfoot visited these posts that they had these sort of occurrences, these tragedies and these disputes. When they weren't around these posts, everything was pretty much back to normal. People were treated each other as people, they had that respect. But because of the alcohol, when they visited these posts and because of the drunkenness, a lot of people died because of violence and because of tragedies that happened around these forts. But you know, still it wasn't a major disruption of the native people's daily lives because they only visited these forts maybe once or twice a year. So it was only during those times that they visited these forts that a few people would, would uh, maybe not handle their liquor and then violence erupted. But for the most part, this happened maybe once or twice a year. And so the people had to wait months before they can get another taste of napiyukki or uh, fire water, the white man's water. So if we look at the next image, here we have a map and you can see in the top there, these are all the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company trading posts. So that yellow area between there and all the way down where Fort Union was, this was all Blackfoot territory. And you can see Fort McKenzie there to closer towards the mountains on the Missouri River. Well, these two camps, or these two trading posts of the Americans are right in the Blackfoot territory. Whereas the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company forts were at the edge, the northern edge of the Blackfoot Territory. But from the North Saskatchewan River all the way down to the Yellowstone, this was the Blackfoot Territory. This was Nitoasin or Nitoasi. This was our land as Blackfoot people. So this was a huge land. When you think of it, you could see right up uh, where the two Saskatchewan rivers meet. That's present day Prince Albert. And Fort Union is where the Missouri and the Yellowstone River meet. So this entire area, the Blackfoot considered their home. And the Blackfoot actually uh, moved, were west of the mountains as well, and they were farther down south. They were allied with the Arapaho, and they were friendly with the Cheyenne. So our Blackfoot people were all along the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, as far as even Colorado up in that area, the Platte River. 
So we had different tribes visiting some of these peoples, other tribes. But this area that's yellow, this was our land. This was the Blackfoot territory as they knew of it then. And all those trading posts in the north, this is where the Blackfoot went to trade with the Hudson Bay Company. And that's the modern day Edmonton and Rocky Mountain House. And then you can see the American forts after 1831 in the middle of Blackfoot country, or at the, um, in, in Blackfoot country, down towards the south. So if we look at the next image, here you can see the American Fur Company's trade route. Now, their base of operations was in St. Louis, and they used a steamboat. First, they used boats to get up river, canoes, and then different types of uh, barges and such. But eventually, they made steamboats, and the steamboats were able to travel all the way up the Missouri River. And eventually, by 1862, they were able to reach Fort Benton as you can see right up there on the map there in the top part. Uh, that was the farthest inland port from the Gulf of Mexico, basically. So St. Louis is kind of right where the Mississippi and the Missouri meet. And this is where all the furs went. So you could see all the different forts that were made before they got to Blackwood country. You could start with Fort Vermilion, up to Fort Lookout, to Fort Pierre. Then you're going to South Dakota and you're coming into the Mandan, Hidatsa, and the Rikara tribes. And then you got Fort Berthold and Fort Clark. And then you see Fort Union right there at the confluence of the rivers. And that was the first time that they were able to trade with the Blackfoot. And eventually they moved in to Fort McKenzie and then finally to Fort Benton. And so Fort Benton was actually the capital of the fur trade at that time. So although whiskey was sold by the American Fur Company, it was not its main stock in trade. So like the HBC and the, the American Fur Company gave liquor as gifts to bring in the customers. And, but they sold it in limited quantities. So they would sell for furs um, a couple of kegs or five gallon kegs of liquor. And they were actually using good liquor. I mean, the American Fur Company, they were using things like rum and whiskey to trade with the Indians. So they gave it as gifts to bring in their customers and they sold limited quantities. But the Americans, they offered more trade items than the British did. And this is one of the reasons why the Blackfoot went to the Americans was because they can get more items, things like mirrors and things like uh, um, co uh, copper coil are different things to use that were useful they got from the Americans as opposed to the British. So the Americans offered more trade items and at a lot cheaper prices and they had more whiskey than the British. And as I mentioned earlier the American Fur Company started to take buffalo robes. One of the things that the British didn't take too much of because uh, they had to use a canoes and these were heavy robes so they could only get take so many buffalo robes up and down the North Saskatchewan River back to the York factory on the Hudson Bay. So they took smaller robes. They, pretend to, they pr preferred to take the uh, beaver and the mink and the muskrat as opposed to a huge buffalo robe. But the Americans, because of the steamboat, they took the, um, they took the uh, buffalo robes. And so because there was, at that time, plenty of buffalo, and this was our staff of life as Blackfoot people, we were able to get a lot of these buffalo robes and trade them with the American Fur Company. So if we look at the next image, <coughs> so the Hudson Bay Company, after 1821, when they merged with the Northwest Company and became the new Hudson Bay Company, they had no rivals for about approximately 10 years. And then when the Americans got into the picture in 1831, well, now there's this new Hudson Bay Company, American Fur Company rivalry. So given this new competition, the Hudson Bay Company felt it had no alternative but to continue to supply liquor. Although used primarily as gifts to cement trade relations, rum and brandy remained an integral part of the British Blackfoot trade. And the, uh, ironically, the American Fur Company was made up of former Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company traders. So they actually adopted the British trade system to compete with the Hudson Bay Company. So they basically became like the Northwest Company, their new competition, and they were doing the same things that the Hudson Bay Company were doing. They were using liquor to entice the tribes into trade, and they sold limited quantities of it, and they gave more goods. So this is one of the reasons why the Blackfoot would uh, go to the Americans with their buffalo robes and they would go to the British with their smaller robes like the beaver or the mink or anything like that. So this is what happened with the Hudson Bay Company and the AFC rivalry. So you know the funny thing is by the time the Americans started their trade with the Blackfoot alcohol had been outlawed by the American government. So the thing is they weren't allowed to sell liquor to the native peoples because of the 1831 or 1830 sorry 1834 I believe intercourse law 
that the Americans had. So that meant that uh, American companies weren't allowed to sell liquor on Blackfoot land, or to Blackfoots, or to Native peoples, period. And even during that time, the Hudson Bay Company tried to eliminate uh, liquor as part of the trade. But when they started competing with another, while well, they used liquor, uh, they justified their use of liquor uh, because of the rivalry. So if we look at the next um, image, now here's the effects of the liquor trade on the Six of Gates at the Peaks by that time. So I wrote in the disastrous effects of the liquor on the Blackfoot while they are at the trading posts and immediately upon their return to camps cannot be questioned. During the decades of excessive distribution by the fur traders, liquor created havoc among the tribes because people killed each other in quarrels and they had serious feuds and disputes. And the only reason it wasn't more serious was because the Blackfoot usually came to trade but twice a year, in the spring and the fall. And this was to bring in their, their furs. So as a result, they usually would have a few nights of drinking at the trading post that might last two or three days. And then they would take a few kegs back to their camps to drink. But for the rest of the year, they remained sober until their next visit. So this, is, this was the effect of the liquor trade on the 68 at the Peaks. They only managed to get this item, this liquor, once and twice a year. But then during the remainder of the year, they went back to their old habits of hunting the buffalo, following the buffalo, their day-to-day -day ceremonies, the different things they would do from day to day until they actually visited these liquor posts. But it wasn't until they came to these liquor posts that bad things happened. And these bad things maybe only happened once or twice a year, as far as the liquor goes. I mean, we'd always have those wars with other tribes, and that could happen any time of the year. But it was during this time when we visited the trading posts that we started to kill each other. And then this was unheard of. And so even in the winter counts, you see a few. At this time, there's just a few um, records of, of bad things happening, of people dying while they were drinking or disputes. But for the most part, it wasn't a major disruption of the Blackfoot people, of our lives, of our, our daily, daily life. Only on visiting these posts did those bad things happen. So if we look at the next image, things changed. So there was great changes. And one of them was like you see in the picture here, they had boats that were going up the Missouri River. And this fort is Fort Benton. It started off as Fort Clay and was just a stockade at first. But over the years, they built it into a fort. And then in the 1850s, it was changed. Its name was changed to Fort Benton. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a bit here. But because of this, there was great changes in the economics and the politics and the settlement of the Upper Missouri region. And this had a major impact on the Siksikaitsi Tapiks, on the Blackfoot-speaking peoples. Because now we had settlers and we had white people and we had a lot of prospectors and people like that moving into our lands at the, um, on this river. And if you remember that map we looked at earlier where Fort Benton was, that's kind of right in the lower portion of Blackfoot territory. It's not at the edge of Blackfoot ter territory, it's actually in the Blackfoot territory. So when these forts were built, there were a lot of uh, settlers and a lot of uh, non-Blackfoots moving into the area. And at first you could see they, people came up through canoes and these larger boats, but that changed. Eventually uh, they were getting steamboats coming up into the area. And these were bringing hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So if we look at the next image, here we have Fort Benton. Yeah, so on Christmas Day in 1850, the American fur company trader Alexander Culbertson, the same man you remember that I said had a Blackfoot wife named Natuista, and her father was a blood chief named uh, Two Sons. Well, this, this trader, Alexander Culbertson, he stood before this new adobe building. So they fixed up the original stockade and made a fort. Because four years after it's, the first stockade was built, this was officially proclaimed Fort Benton. So Albert, Alexander Culbertson named this place Fort Benton after a U.S. politician that put a stop to the factory trade, as they called it. So Fort Benton was the only white settlement in what 14 years later, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, would proclaim the Montana Territory. So here's the original uh, Fort Benton and its adobe color, it's white. If we look at the next image. <coughs> so things were happening after 1850. 
One of these things was in 1855, a man by the name of Isaac I. Stevens, who was a newly appointed governor of the Washington Territory, he convened a huge council and brought the Blackfoot into direct negotiations with the American government for the first time. So this is the first time the Americans treated with the Blackfoot. And so there's a lot of promises made during this treaty that were never fulfilled. And the Blackfoot never forgot this. So the Lambeau Treaty, as this uh, treaty became known, was signed on the 17th of October in 1855. And this document would ultimately affect the sale of liquor to the Blackfoot. Now in this document, if you look at the next image, talk a little bit more about the Lame Bull Treaty. Uh, most important of its provisions were Articles 4 and 5, which described the Blackfoot hunting grounds as a huge reservation encompassing mo almost the entire part of Montana territory, east of the Rocky Mountains and north of the Missouri River. So this, under this federal legislation passed in 1834, such a reservation was automatically designated as Indian Territory, and the sale of intoxicants was prohibited. So another provision made it illegal for any Indian to bring liquor into his hunting grounds. And so this was all ironic because this Fort Benton was actually on the north side of the river and this was on Blackfoot territory. And they weren't even supposed to be in this part. They were supposed to be off the reservation. They were supposed to be on the other side of the Missouri River. But no, they built this fort and they built a settlement right in Blackfoot territory. And ironically, this was the capital of the whiskey trade, Fort Benton. And because it was situ situated on Blackfoot land, the whiskey trade shouldn't have happened. It was totally illegal. And for them to even sell liquor to the natives was totally illegal, according to the American law. But these traders didn't care because they knew they were making huge profits selling whiskey to the Blackfoot people and some of the other tribes. But mostly Fort Benton went to the Blackfoot because it was right, like I mentioned, right in the Blackfoot territory. So very few other tribes came to this particular fort to trade. So we look at the next image. Another thing that happened in the 50s was the gold rush. So another major change was along the upper Missouri uh, was the discovery of gold in 1856. So over the next few years, it brought in literally not just hundreds, but thousands of prospectors to the area. So unlike the fur traders, these men had no business to conduct with the natives. And in fact, they considered the natives to be pests who stole their horses and interfered with their prospecting and bothered them in their camps. So these prospectors, they didn't hesitate to trespass on Blackfoot lands in their unquenchable thirst for gold. And in the inevitable confrontations that followed, deaths occurred on both sides. So there was a lot of injustice that were happening at this time, and there was no law, really. So a lot of these prospectors, they would just open fire and they would kill native peoples that they saw Particularly, this was Blackfoot country, so a lot of those native peoples were Blackfoot that were being killed. And so after a time, the Blackfoot would just kill these prospectors. If they came into their lands or they came too close to our camps, the Blackfoot would attack them and would kill as many of them as they possibly could to try and drive them off our lands. But like I mentioned, there's literally hundreds, if not you know, a few thousand of these people who came in to the Blackfoot territory. So there was a lot of deaths on the Blackfoot side as well. So if we look at the next image, and just to mention too, a lot of these prospectors, a lot of them left, but a lot of them stayed. And those ones that stayed got to know the Blackfoot lands very well as far as creeks and as far as rivers that flowed into the Missouri because they followed a lot of these creek beds looking for their gold. So here we get back to Fort Benton. As you can see in the image there, you can see the little boats, you know, the poles there that people are pushing themselves up river. But now we got the steamboats. Now they had a shallow base there and they were able to travel on the river. They didn't have to be... Uh, big bows in the front there to cut through the water. So these steamboats were able to make it all the way up to Fort Benton. And this was incredible when you really think about it, because these steamboats could leave the Gulf of Mexico and travel all the way up to Mississippi and then go on to the Missouri from St. Louis all the way up to a place like Fort Benton, which is right kind of near the mountains. And so in 1862, the first steamboats to arrive made Fort Benton the furthest inland port 3,485 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. So one of these steamboats could travel from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up 3,485 miles to Fort Benton. And then these steamboats could carry people, and this is what they did. They carried a lot of settlers, prospectors, miners, such, and they brought these people into Fort Benton. And then once they got to Fort Benton with the people and goods, whiskey, uh, trade goods, then they could take literally thousands of buffalo robes all the way back downriver to a place like St. Louis where they processed them. 
So towns such as Virginia City and Helena, these places sprung up in Montana. And there were saloons in these uh, cities. And these are open to serve the thirsty miners and the prospectors and people who are in those cities. And the liquor they sold came up the Missouri River by the steamboats. And it was held in warehouses in Fort Benton. So Fort Benton wasn't only just the farthest inland post, it was also a storage depot for liquor and for trade goods and for whiskey. So until these uh, items could be hauled over land by bull trains and by horses to the gold mining regions to the west, Fort Benton was basically the capital at that time. So it wasn't only the center of the Blackfoot trade, but it was also the location of uh, storage depots, warehouses, and these contained a lot of whiskey and a lot of uh, trade goods. So this wasn't good for the Blackfoot people because this was right in Blackfoot lands. So there was a steady supply of trade goods, yes, but there was also a steady supply of whiskey. And this was the Montana's storage uh, capital, Fort Benton. So this was all happening by 1862. So by this time, there was literally thousands of people living in the Blackfoot territory that were non-Blackfoot. So if we look at the next image. Well, around the same time, another event to affect the Blackfoot-speaking peoples was the sale of the American Fur Company's forts on the Upper Missouri in 1865. So the American Fur Company sold a lot of their forts. Uh, so like the Hudson's Bay Company, the AFC, they provided stability in their regions because they only distributed enough liquor to meet its competition. So they knew that they would sell maybe just a small bit of liquor to the, the Blackfoot people who came in to trade, but they controlled it. They controlled it so that there wasn't so much of it out there to, to keep them drunk all the time and not get the trade. They only gave them the liquor to get the trade items, to get them feeling good, and then they would leave. And then maybe six months later, that tribe would come back and have more furs and things to sell. So but by the late 1860s, the American Fur Company, their influence was gone. The old established traders were gone and the Blackfoot-speaking peoples were left to the mercy of, a, of small and middle-sized trading firms. And these groups were all intent on making as much profit as they possibly can. They weren't uh, huge uh, national companies, they were just little companies, and they wanted to get as much as they can fur-wise from the Blackfoots uh, by selling uh, things like fire water or whiskey, adulterated whiskey, whiskey that was mixed in or that was made up uh, from cheap whiskey or from uh, alcohol, literal clear alcohol mixed with all sorts of things to give it a bite, to make it fire water. That's why the Blackfoot called uh, Napiochi fire water, was because they put things like Jamaica ginger in there, or they put in peppers, or they put in black molasses, or chewing tobacco, or even smoking tobacco. And they would steep it in the inside of the, the tea and make this concoction that they would sell to the Blackfoot people, and the, and the Blackfoot would get drunk off of this. So this is what happened after the American Fur Company folded and the Hudson Bay Company start, stopped selling liquor in 1862 while this liquor trade was picked up by these independent traders. And then these people, they weren't selling good liquor, they were selling adulterated liquor. And a lot of it was poisonous to the Blackfoot people. So if we look at the next image, yeah, and these people were called free traders. So with the withdrawal of the Hudson Bay Company from trade and the dissolution of the American Fur Company, this opportunity arose for free traders and opportunists to enter the scene. So as I mentioned, unlike the large companies, these traders made no attempt to restrict the scale of their business and often dealing with whiskey as their main stock in trade. So a lot of these uh, traders, they would come and trade, but they wouldn't trade so much trade goods. They would come with uh, fire water, with kegs of whiskey to sell for uh, buffalo furs and such. And that became their main stock in trade. So this result became a formula for disaster, especially for the Blackfoot-speaking peoples, the Siksikaiti Tabiks. So we look at the next image. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the whiskey merchants. So this man's picture here, Isaac G. Baker, when he arrived in Fort Benton in 1864, he was the last American Fur Company chief trader. So he was working for the AFC, but when the AFC decided to sell their forts, he decided to become an independent businessman. So he left the fur trade behind, and once the original Fort Benton was sold, he invested in a boatload of inventory, and a lot of this was whiskey, in the spring of 1866. And then he opened the first general store on the town's main street, and he wholesaled uh, trade items and trade goods and whiskey to independent wagon owners who bartered goods with the Blackfoot and with the Crow to the south. 
So he was the first merchant in uh, Fort Benton, and he actually made a killing. But he, um, if we look at the next image, we see who his, next, who his rival was. Now this was his rival, and this was a man named Baker, Tom Power, I should say. So within a year, Baker had his first outpost, outpost amongst Bikani on the Marias River. And about the same time, he welcomed to town a man who would become his chief competition. And this is the man pictured there. His name was Tom Power. So Tom Power adopted his own way of conducting business. But they agreed that the frontier was big enough for both of them, and they became friendly rivals. In fact, they would throw their money together to, um, to get the first steamboats to come up to Missouri to bring their goods down and bring uh, trade goods up the Missouri River. So in a lot of things, they collaborated. And both of them had their stock of whiskey. So this man actually became a whiskey trader as well, a whiskey merchant. And they would uh, outfit the people who were willing to go out to the tribes, and they would give them trade goods, trade items on credit, and give them uh, whiskey. And then when these people would sell all of these trade goods and this whiskey, they can come back and pay these whiskey merchants. And so these two men became the main powers in the town of Fort Benton. And these were the ones who were kind of responsible for the, the whiskey trade with the Blackfoot. Now, if we look at the next image, well, as I mentioned, these guys were the first whiskey merchants in Fort Benton. So whiskey took on a new importance as a commodity after Isaac Baker and Tom Power came into town. Before then, whiskey was sold to get as much, but now these two men were bringing in gallons, literally thousands of gallons of liquor into Fort Benton through their steamboats. So these two merchants, they dominated Fort Benton and became the primary suppliers for the whiskey trade. And these men controlled the Indian trade during the decade or so when it was important to Northern Montana's economy. And when the whiskey they dispensed was the most, well, it was the most destructive force imaginable to the Indians in Montana and the Canadian prairies. So to the Blackfoot, Crow, and a lot of these other tribes, this whiskey just um, weakened our tribes on an incredible scale. So their competition was the beginning of the outpost trade. So basically because of the law controlling the liquor in the town of Fort Benton, they had a U.S. Marshal and they had a Sheriff, they were kind of controlled somewhat by the law. So they, what they started to do was they, they got people to build outposts, these little posts that are out of town on the Missouri up and down the Missouri and at these posts this is where they would trade with the natives and it was the easiest way of trafficking alcohol without constant interference from the from the law from the Indian agent or the local marshal so they were able to make money and by the time the law got out to these places the, the traders would be gone and they would have already left and so there was nobody to arrest so they're, they're the ones who started the outpost trade as they call it so if we look at the next image Okay, the Blackfoot War. So this was actually from the time of 1862, right up until 1869. And during this time, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of battles, a lot of bloodshed between uh, white settlers, our people who were coming into the Blackfoot lands, and amongst the Blackfoot. So Montana's territory, rough frontier, their mining population, combined with the whiskey trade, horse raiding, and Indians being dispossessed of their hunting grounds, because this is what happened when the white people moved into Fort Benton. Uh, those areas south and north of them, which were uh, former hunting grounds for the Blackfoot and the Crow and other people, all of a sudden they were taken over. So these natives that were camping in these particular areas before there was any white people that moved into the area, now they couldn't move or even live in these areas anymore because now they're kind of taken over by these, uh, these settlers that were coming in. So because of this, there was a lot of incidents that happened, beginning in 1865, that these local people living in Fort Benton called the Blackfoot War. So there was lots of confrontations, and there's a lot of hostility. In fact, whenever some Blackfoots would show up, the Fort Bentonites would just automatically open fire on these natives because they considered them uh, enemy. And it, wasn't, it was also that same way with the Blackfoot. Whenever they saw any Fort Bentonites or any white people crossing the river going further into Blackfoot country, the Blackfoot would attack them and kill them. So there was a lot of hostility, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of anger, and there's ruthlessness on the part of both the Six Gates, the Beaks, and the settlers in the Fort Benton area. And this all kind of lasted up until 1870 with uh, Eugene Baker's massacre of a peaceful tribe of Blackfoot on the Marias River. But if we look at the next image, so this Blackfoot War, many of the problems in the Blackfoot War, they resulted from the trafficking in whiskey in and around Fort Benton. 
So these whiskey traders, even though it was illegal, they usually bought small amounts of liquor, either from the saloons or from one of the trading companies, and then they sold it to the Indians on the outskirts of town after nightfall. So they would go to the Blackfoot, or to the Crow, mostly the Blackfoot, and they would sell this liquor. Even though they knew it was illegal, and they knew that there was marshals and that there was uh, the law, United States law that would arrest them if they saw them doing this, a lot of these people would do it under cover of darkness when people couldn't see them. And then they would go in the outskirts and they would meet certain Indians and they would sell liquor to them, usually like in bottles, as you can see here, or they'd sell them in kegs, small kegs to the Blackfoot. And the Blackfoot were eager uh, customers. But it was because of this trade that a lot of people believe this Blackfoot war existed because of a lot of the whiskey traders and their uh, no limits on what they did as far as the law were. So if you look at the next image, so these free traders, as you can see here, they're right in the Blackfoot camps. So this is something the Hudson Bay Company never did. They stayed in their forts, and the American Fur Company, the same thing. They built their forts, and they waited for the natives to come to the forts to do their trading. And then this is where the liquor would be sold. But the free traders had no such qualms. These people went right into the Blackfoot camps where they saw them, and then, as you can see on the back of the one horse there, they have liquor and kegs. And they would come and sell this fire water or this uh, adulterated whiskey to the Blackfoot. Because for the most part, a lot of this whiskey wasn't real whiskey. And it wasn't um, made by a distillery or anything like that, 40 proof as they would call it or whatever. No, this was mostly moonshine whiskey. And then once they had this uh, alcohol made, then they would mix it with things, as I mentioned earlier, like tobacco or they would put on black molasses. And if you know the color of alcohol, pure alcohol, it's white. I mean, it's clear, just like water. If you were to put both of the pure alcohol and water into uh, two see-through glasses, it would look the same. So the Blackfoot wouldn't buy alcohol that looked like water. They wanted whiskey or rum. And this rum and whiskey had a darker color. So a lot of these traders, in order to trick the Blackfoot into thinking they were buying whiskey, would put in things such as uh, tobacco and steep the tobacco in this alcohol for a period of time. And this would be chewing tobacco or just regular tobacco. Sometimes they use black molasses or they would use ink or they would use a, a blue stone, copper, or any number of different items just to give it coloring and to give it bite. And they would put in peppers and they would put Jamaica ginger to make it hot tasting or however. But this is what they would sell to the Blackfoot people. And the people would um, freely give their tan buffalo robes to these traders just for uh, one buffalo robe for basically one, one bottle of this liquor. And the buffalo trade was 35 cents it cost to make this liquor. And so for one cup of cost 35 cents of liquor or adulterated liquor, you could get one buffalo robe. So that buffalo robe would be sold to Tom Baker or to Isaac G. I mean, Isaac G. Baker or Tom Power, the whiskey merchants, for maybe $6. And then these men would take these robes all the way down to St. Louis and trade them for $16 a piece. So for the whiskey merchants, this was huge for them. They made huge profits off of this because one 35 cent cup of whiskey equaled one buffalo robe. So that 35 cents became $16. So this is the whiskey trade and why so many of these people were willing to go into the Blackfoot camps to do this sort of trade because they knew they could make huge profits off of this just by selling whiskey and nothing else. They wouldn't sell them pots, pans. They wouldn't sell them uh, uh, trade items like blankets or uh, um, scissors, mirrors and such. They just sold this adulterated whiskey and they made a huge profit. So if we look at the next image, we can see by 1867, this trade extended to a number of outposts, points along the Missouri River. And they were fed by the increasing presence of the steamboat traffic. So by 1867, they're literally having steamboats coming up and down the Missouri River. Literally thousands, like within that time period from 62 to 67, there was return trips, there were so many steamboats coming up the river. And every time a steamboat came up, they were bringing people and trade goods and whiskey. And they were bringing back down to St. Louis piles and piles of buffalo robes. So this was huge. And there was more and more people moving into this area. So a lot of Americans, and the funny thing is by 1867, by the end of the Civil War, a lot of these people that were coming into the Blackfoot country were those people who lost the Civil War. The Confederates, people from the South, they had no more homes or lands that they can call their own. So a lot of them moved west into the frontier towns. 
And Fort Benton was one of them. They, Fort Benton literally had hundreds and hundreds of Confederates, former Confederates living in that town. And these people were used to violence and fighting and because of the Civil War. So they really didn't care that the Blackfoot were uh, suffering from this whiskey trade. They just wanted to make as much profits as they possibly could. So this is by 1867, this trade had exploded and extended to a number of different points, as it says there, along the Missouri River. So if we look at the next image, so that by the spring of 1868, a new rush of homesteaders was underway. So at this same time, Fort Benton's two main traders, Baker and Power, plus a number of smaller outfits with whiskey at the ready, they were trading on the Marias River. So Baker and Power were the main guys, but there also were a few other outfits like Carroll and Steele, and I can't remember the other one, but there were some smaller outfits, but they had a lot of whiskey as well, and they were trading with the Blackfoot. And here you can see on the Fort Benton uh, wharf there, these barrels, and these barrels were all filled with whiskey. These were filled with uh, uh, whiskey and, and rum and adulterated uh, fire water. So if we look at the next image, We'll talk about Mountain Chief. You know, during the time that Fort Benton was starting to expand and there was more and more settlers coming in, this town was actually kind of like in the territory of this one particular chief, and this was Mountain Chief. So much to these traders' surprise, this Bikani chief they encountered, he had no use for them. He had no use for any of these people going onto his lands. He saw what was happening. He saw that these traders were going right to the camps and selling liquor to uh, the people. And these people would in turn get drunk and then a lot of bad things are happening. And this wasn't happening just like once or twice a year. This was happening daily. So this man didn't like it. And he was, um, as I mentioned, he was one of the Picani's main chiefs. So that at least three competing trade wagons were sent packing. So he chased them away. He told them, you guys go back and don't stop until you get to the river and you get back to Fort Benton. And then Isaac Baker's traders, who were on some of the main traders, even these ones were driven away. And these ones made a plea with this chief, you know, let us stay here and then we'll trade with you, we'll give you all these things. But, you know, Mountain Chief wasn't for it. He basically was like, no. He said, don't stop until you get to Fort Benton. I don't want you in my lands. And so he told him, and actually, you know, just a few months before, he actually went to Fort Benton and went to the Indian agent and told him he didn't like these people coming onto his land for them to stop these traders. But these people didn't want to do that because they knew that was profits for the city at that time, at Fort Benton. So. This man was anxious. He, he wanted to keep the fire water away from his people. So as I mentioned, he visited the fort and he explained to the federal official that his tribe would bring robes to the fort like they did in the old days if they wished to trade. In fact, he said, we want the new traders to act like the old men who traded long ago. And then he said, we do not wish these pale faces to come to our villages. There is nothing in common between us. So Mountain Chief mentioned that to them. But you know, what ended up happening was they kicked him out of town and they roughed him up and then then he told them when they came into their lands that, that fall, he chased them out of there. So because of that, they started to vilify him. So the Fort Bentonites and a lot of these white settlers at that time, the newspapers, they all made it sound like Mountain Chief was to blame for all, every, any white man killed in that territory. Any trader that was killed, it was because of Mountain Chief. But you know, I like to set the record straight here. Mountain Chief was not uh, an evil person. He was just looking out for his tribe because he saw the true evil, the whiskey traders that were coming into the camps to sell whiskey. These people he did not want to be coming into the camps because he wanted the whiskey trade to be like it was in the old days when he was a young man. And that's when they visited the forts once or twice a year to trade their goods. But now that changed because of the free traders. Now they were bringing whiskey to the camps wherever the Blackfoot were camped these whiskey traders would be going into these camps to trade their whiskey. And this was something he didn't want, and he foresaw what was happening. And in fact, because of this, after he died, things got worse. So if we actually look at the next image, we can see here, so what was the government's response to uh, Mountain Chief telling them not to bring white men onto his res? Well, the federal agent at that time, he, they licensed two traders to set up posts on the on the Teton and the Marias rivers. So basically they said, okay, well, what, how they responded to Mountain Chief's pleas was, no, we're not gonna stop white people from going onto your res, but what we'll do is we'll license two groups to go onto your res, and these two groups are the only ones that can sell trade goods to your people. So they figured that they can get some control over the trading situation when they decided to do this late in 1868 to permit two firms to operate trading posts on the Blackfoot Reservation. 
beginning in the 1868-69 season. So they, the government, the U.S. government that is, they believe that placing licenses in the hands of these two traders, that, which was subject to cancellation if they were found selling liquor, that they would encourage the Sixty Gates to Beaks to trade with them and that such companies would have permanent posts with a large stock of goods as opposed to just whiskey who worked off the back of their wagons and that these licensed traders would be more, be more likely to report any licit sales of liquor that were cutting into their business. So basically they believed that if they gave these two posts permission to sell on the Black River Reserve, if um, tree traders were to go in there and start trading, that these guys would report back to the government and then the government would in turn punish these free traders going into Blackfoot lands. This is what they hoped would happen. If we look at the next image, that was, it totally didn't happen. So one license was given to I.G. Baker for a post on the Marias River. And then another one was given to the Northwest Fur Company for a post to be operated by John Ripplinger on the Teton River. So although the trade was brisk, the government hopes that such posts would discourage a whiskey trade. It proved to be groundless. It never happened. They were unable to stop these whiskey traders. In fact, they were, uh, you could say they were almost unwilling to stop these whiskey traders. So as soon as the posts were located so that the people knew where they were, the whiskey traders from Sun River and every place else, they began to congregate around these forts. They would camp around these posts and they would set up camps within a mile or two of the posts and sell whiskey to the six gates at the peaks. So every time the Blackfoot would go to these particular posts to trade for trade goods, then these guys would intercept them along the way and sell whiskey and, and sell as much as they could and get as many robes as they could from these Blackfoot that were going to sell at the trading posts. So this affected the trading post business. They actually didn't make much money because of all of these uh, whiskey traders, unlicensed whiskey traders intercepting the trade. So if we look at the next image, we can see these unlicensed whiskey traders that are at Blackfoot camps. So while John Ripplinger completed the Northwest Fur Company post on the Teton River and uh, like the Baker post on the Marias, these two posts, they remained entirely free of liquor in order to maintain their trading license. But they found that difficult to compete with the whiskey traders, so the sellers, because these guys virtually invaded every six of gates at the camp along the Marias and Teton rivers and sold their whiskey. So these Blackfoot would buy the whiskey from these unlicensed whiskey traders and they wouldn't even go to the trading posts that had trade goods. So the thing is, these unlicensed whiskey traders were going right into the Blackfoot camps to trade for whiskey. And so a lot of these Blackfoot didn't even go to the licensed trading posts. So these whiskey traders, as like Mountain Chief didn't want, they would go right to the camps and sell this liquor to the Blackfoot. And it caused so much chaos and it disrupted the daily life of the Blackfoot people because a lot of these people would stay drunk, literally, as long as they had furs to trade, they would stay drunk. So a lot of them became addicted to this fire water. So if we look at the next image. So John Ripplinger of the Northwest Fur Company and Isaac Baker's delegate, William Conrad, they first became first-hand witnesses to the chaotic winter while stationed at their outposts. Because remember, at their outposts, they weren't selling liquor. So they were, they were looking around. They were looking at all the business that was going on around them. And they weren't involved in the actual liquor trade uh, selling liquor, they're selling true trade goods, but they could see that the whiskey traders were getting all the business. So Ripplinger, he complained that the whiskey traders constantly intercepted the Blackfoot tribesmen headed their way, and he would fill them with rot gut and garnering their robes. So this is what the traders called that type of whiskey, rot gut whiskey. And that was probably because that's what it did to people. It was poisonous, it wasn't good for them. So many wagon traders, they positioned themselves strategically along the Blackfoot travel routes to ply their trade and to intercept their bounty of robes. So a lot of these whiskey traders made a lot of money off of this, made a lot of profits by intercepting the Blackfoot people and going right to the Blackfoot camps to trade. So if we look at the next image, so what did this do? So we look at the effects of the liquor trade on the six gates at the peaks. Well, earlier, if we remember, uh, we were talking about it when the Blackfoot would go to the trading posts once twice a year. And then there was bad things that happened during those visits, but they only happened once or twice a year. So you could see three days, maybe bad things happening at the end of June or the beginning of July. And then again, maybe in October or November. But 
for the most part at that time, whiskey didn't affect the Blackfoot people, didn't affect our day-to-day -day lives. And then you got to remember intoxicants of any kind had been unknown to the Blackfoot prior to European contact. So even before we met the uh, European peoples, we did not drink. The Blackfoot people did not drink. We simply uh, did not have any types of intoxicants to get drunk on. So it wasn't until the Europeans came and uh, particularly the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, and then we would get liquor from them, but small amounts, enough to get you drunk, maybe for one or two days, and that was it. And then they wouldn't sell any of it. They would just do the trade. So although rum and whiskey had been around since the 1770s, the tribes had only limited access to it when they visited the trading posts once, twice a year. And at that time, as we mentioned, you know, then they had a big drunk going into it wholeheartedly. They would drink for days, celebrating and performing just the same way when they performed rituals or fighting with the enemy. And after they got drunk, they returned to their camps and remained sober for the rest of the year, several months until their next trip to the fort. And this is how it had been for literally a hundred years for the Blackfoot when we started to trade and get liquor from the traders. But as I mentioned, the day-to-day -day lives were unaffected. They didn't do nothing for us. And in fact, at this time, it was mostly the old people who drank. It's even written that a lot of the young people didn't drink. It was the old people, the ones who did the wheeling and dealing and business with the uh, fort traders. These are the ones who usually got drunk and they would give a little portion of their stuff to their wives or older people who they invited into their camps, etc. So this was the pattern and it was well established over the years. But when the whiskey traders started to come into the camps, then things changed because they were encouraged to extend their drinking year round. Now this wasn't just once or twice a year. Now they were drinking literally every day and they could do it all year. So if you look at the next image, as I mentioned, you know, many older men had shown restraint during this time, this difficult period, because, you know, they were accustomed to drinking once or twice a year. And at that time, they pretty much behaved themselves, but then a lot of them would argue and there was some death and there was some destruction at that time. But they were accustomed, as they were, to the traditional twice yearly visits to the fur trading posts. Well, so during this time when the whiskey started coming into the camps, the worst offenders were the young and middle-aged men. Because these people, they plunged into this, uh, into this way of life, this strange new world, with no concern for the future and no memory of the past. They didn't worry about what was in the days to come. They would just get their liquor and they would drink. And they lived for the moment when alcohol carried them into delirium of intoxication and into self-destructive ways like addictions, a way of life they had never known before. And the thing is, a lot of these people would do it wholeheartedly. They were waiting for the whiskey traders. Some of them got more wives just to make more uh, tanned hides so they could trade these tanned hides for fire water. And then they would drink. And then during this time, you know, their aggressions, these young men, these people that were drinking now, because, you know, before, as I mentioned, it was the older ones who drank. Now, during this period of time, it was the younger men and the middle-aged men who were drinking. And their aggressions, which once was directed towards the enemy, now that it was pointed inward in towards the tribe, towards their own people. So these young men were easily offended and they often reacted to an innocent comment or action with violence. And there's a lot of death or permanent injury that was the result. So these people, they drank, they argued, they fought, and they killed. And this is what was going on during this part of the whiskey trade from around 1865 up until about 1869. So there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of bad things that happened because of the liquor trade on the Siksik at the Peaks. And the big difference from the earlier years was, as I mentioned, was now that the liquor, these free traders are coming into the Blackfoot camps daily, almost daily or every other day with whiskey, with fire water. And our young men were the ones that were getting drunk and killing their spouses, domestic abuse, neglecting their children. A lot of those things happened to the Blackfoot people after the 60s, um, eight, uh, 1960s, during the, what they called the 60s scoop. Especially for the Blackfoot here at Siksika and of the other Blackfoot tribes, liquor became available to us in 1860 when uh, liquor rights, we got our liquor rights as a tribe, as a people. Now we were free to leave the reserve, now we were free to vote, and now we were free to go into the liquor stores. Because before then, before the 1865, before the 60, 1965, before the 60s scoop, our people were not allowed to go into these establishments. We weren't even allowed to buy liquor because of the Indian Act. It wasn't until after 1960 when we got our liquor rights that we were able to start doing these. And this is funny because 
We never learned from the past. And so our people started doing the same things that were happening at that time during the whiskey trade. In 1960, our people were doing what people were doing in uh, 1865, 100 years earlier. They were killing one another. They were fighting one another because of whiskey. They were neglecting their children. And then they were beating their wives and killing their wives. And this was the, the domestic ab abuse. And all of this because of the whiskey and because uh, they started drinking and started drowning their sorrows whenever bad things did happen. So this was the effect of the liquor trade on the Sixty Gates at the Beaks from 1865 up until 1869. And the bad thing is it only got worse because at this time, a lot of the tribes who didn't want to trade with the Americans were able to freely leave and go back to the British and go back to the northern parts of our land. But as they did that, some of these traders decided to go into the Blackfoot land, to go farther north. And that's going to be what we're going to discuss in the part three of this particular series, uh, the liquor trade, uh, the history of firewater and the six gates at the Beaks, when from 1870 up until the arrival of the Northwest Mounted Police. So if we look at the next image, Okay, so as I mentioned, not all families were cursed by the craving for whiskey. But even those chiefs who were able to control their people, they faced problems because it only took a few rowdies to trigger chaos. Maybe um, most, for the most part, your camp is peaceful. But then one or two or three people go out and get a keg of whiskey and get drunk and they kill somebody within the camp. And then usually because of our justice, there was retaliation and so more death resulted. And this is what the whiskey did even amongst those uh, tribes that were trying to stay away from it. And in fact, a lot of tribes moved to Canada. You know, one of the chiefs, Issa Bumaksika, uh, Crowfoot, that's what he did with his followers. They stayed away from the Americans during this time. They went as far as they could into the Hand Hills and into our hunting areas north towards the North Saskatchewan River. And they would trade with the Hudson Bay Company traders there who weren't selling whiskey after 1862. So a lot of them moved away from the chaos that was happening in the United States across the medicine line. So these drunken quarrels and savage fights would break out in the camps, often ending in death, and other times whole camps erupted into drunken orgies of violence, with friends and brothers turning on one another. So this is what the liquor trade did to our people. So with the upheaval as it was in Montana Territory, the, a lot of the Siksika and the Gaina and some Pikani were staying north of the border and during, doing most of their trading with the Hudson Bay Company in a peaceful climate. So a lot of tribes tried to leave their, the southern portion of our our, uh, our lands because of this liquor trade. And it was during this time that our people were seriously weakened because those people who weren't drinking couldn't trust those people that were. Because those people that were drinking could do anything from rob you, beat you, kill you, simply because you either had or wouldn't share or didn't have whiskey. So there was a lot of problems that happened because of this uh, whiskey trade. And a lot of chiefs, had a hard time controlling it amongst their own people, especially amongst the young, the young men and whatever who would go out there and trade their robes with the whiskey traders. So a lot of violence was happening during this time. And this whiskey trade seriously weakened the Blackfoot speaking peoples. Because of this, a lot of tribes, a lot of our enemy tribes, they noticed this amongst our tribe and they would attack us and steal our horses and attack small camps and almost wipe out a lot of small camps because they knew that there was uh, no other camp nearby that would help them. Either that camp was drinking or it was, there wasn't anything nearby to back up the one camp. So this seriously weakened us as a people, this whiskey trade. So if we look at the next image. Okay, so this was like a harbinger of things to come. In the hopes of improving this trade for the Northwest Fur Company, Ripplinger decided to build a new post farther down the Marias River at a place called Red Cooley. So this was actually pretty close to the British border. So Ripplinger's decision to build a new post closer to the British border, it was a harbinger of things to come because many, Mon trader, many Montana traders would, in fact, they extend their trading activities into the British possessions during the 1869-70 trading season. And one of these peoples was a man by the name of John Jerome Healy and his buddy, Alfred Hamilton. They crossed the line and they built the F Fort Whoopa, as it became known, which is one of the main uh, centers of trade outside of the American, American territory, across the line into the British territory, as they called it. But this was all Blackfoot land. That's why the Blackfoot would go back and forth freely. So if we look at the next image, these are some of the books that you could read as a, 
as people, if you want to learn a little bit more about the whiskey trade and about the trade with the Blackfoot and with uh, different tribes, this is a good book to look at. It's called Indians in the Fur Trade and it was written by a man named Arthur J. Ray. And he talks about the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company trade with the different tribes eventually getting to the uh, mountains of the North Saskatchewan River and then trading with the Blackfoot tribes. And then uh, if we look at the next image, this is another book you should fire by the late great Hugh Dempsey. Now Hugh Dempsey was a writer and he has a lot of dates and times of events and things that happened. And this book, Firewater, talks about the impact of the whiskey trade on the Blackfoot, particularly uh, Woopup, the Woopup Trail uh, from uh, present day Lethbridge and all the different posts that sprung up that went all the way as far as the Red Deer River. And these are all Americans that were moving in, selling their firewater to the Blackfoot people and then it wasn't until the Northwest Mounted Police came to put a stop to this. But there was a lot of things that happened. So if you wanted to read about that and learn a little bit more about the impact of the whiskey trade on the Blackfoot Nation, this is a good book to read and this should be amongst your uh, personal library. Now if we look at the next image, this is a book by a man named Roger D. Tushi. And this is Bear Child. And so this talks about Jerry Potts. Now Jerry Potts really was a unique man and he was uh, involved in the whiskey trade. He was actually one of the people who brought the people out to Blackfoot Country. And then at the same time, he brought the Northwest Mounted Police out to Blackfoot Country to put a stop to the whiskey trade. And so actually Jerry Potts was known as Gyayokos in Blackfoot. And in fact, they looked at him as one of us. He wasn't, even though uh, he might've been mixed blood, he was half Scotton and his mother was a blood lady. He, he was looked at as a Blackfoot. So his, he spoke Blackfoot fluently. And in fact, he was one of the translators at uh, signing a treaty number seven. So this is a good book to have in your library, Bear Child by uh, Roger D. Tushi. And then you could look at this book. And this is an awesome book to read. And this is Blackfoot history, the winter counts. So this is actually the Blackfoot history. This is um, what was written in the winter counts on these hides. And they told of events by uh, pictographs as to what happened during particular years. And so from 1765 on all the way up until just the early part of the 20th century, we learn a lot about what the Blackfoot considered the most important event of that particular year. And it would be written on their winter counts. And then you can use this uh, book to see what happened during the time when whiskey became prevalent amongst our people. And then you could see all the new pictographs representing new things that happened to our Blackfoot people, such as domestic violence, which was unheard of before this. Even though there was violence and everything, usually if you're a wife, your husband did not touch you, because if he did, your brothers or your male kin would kill him. But during this whiskey trade, a lot of bad things happened. So domestic violence happened, brothers killed one another, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a good book to have and to read. So with that, I'll leave it with you and uh, say goodbye and I'll see you next week. Gata Matsin. But in the meantime, remember COVID's still out there. Be safe. And we'll be coming to you with part three of this series of Firewater and the Blackfoot in the days to come. Take care of yourself.